My name is Chris and welcome to the first of the R for Data Science Community Talks. Uh, today I'll be talking a little bit about how I've been working with, sci uh, with my students to help them develop as scientists using R Markdown and Shiny. Now R Markdown is a great tool that you can use where you can incorporate R and, and graphics that you get from R and analysis that you do for R with regular text and they produce various types of outputs such as HTML or PDF. I work with students and so I'm helping students learn how to use these tools to make appropriate figures to visualize their data and communicate results effectively to a variety of, of audiences. But I also use it as a teaching tool and a way to, for me to communicate my information to those students. Now one of the issues I've been working on recently and still am working on is how to make student data reports consistent. And so I'm going to run down some of what I've been working with with our, our markdown templates and more recently combining R Markdown with Shiny to make these interactive and educational applications. Throughout my talk, uh, I'll be using various materials that I've deposited in the GitHub site that you see here, as well as I've got the slides for today's talk. So if you want to stop now, go pull up the slides, go pull up some of the documents, and follow along with me, that would be great. So for context, I work at a in a chemistry and biochemistry department at a mid-sized public university. I'm a biochemist by training, and so a lot of my interests are working out the basic chemistry that makes biology run. And I do this with a lab of undergraduates. My department is undergraduates only. Uh, and I also teach undergraduate biochemistry, both a lecture and lab courses. And so I use R for visualizing my data sets that I, that I generate from my lab, and others have generated, uh, communicating these ideas in the form of figures to both my colleagues but also students, and I'm using it as a learning tool to help students create data figures that are effective in, in conveying information to a broad audience. So my very first work with R was visualizing a data set where we were looking at, at DNA group widths, and so I have a representation of DNA shown here and a protein bound and we were interested in understanding how changes in DNA groove width affected whether this protein bound or not. The way we did this was we took an approach to simulate the dynamics of this entire system and we did this uh, four different ways and then we measured the width of the grooves and the grooves are from these peaks here all across the molecule and so we had about 40 positions that we were looking at and we did a thousand measurements at each of these positions and we got a massive file, at least for me, that was just a bunch of numbers. And I struggled to analyze this in Excel and finally decided to break down and try to learn R and produce a figure that would, produce, that would not only be informative but also could give a sense of how the DNA groups were changing depending on the conditions that we were analyzing. And that's the figure that you see here. So the way I generated this was first, I took the Excel file that I started with and imported it, and I had about 40,000 measurements. Um, and the page numbers that you see here refer to page numbers in the book that give you a sense of how to do this. I then tidied the data uh, using gather and filter to, to get rid of abnormal measurements that, that pop out because of the way the simulation works, and also gather the data so it was nice and easy to plot. I then wanted to color code it so that I could match it up with my figure. So I used the mutate function to generate a new column that would tell R which way to color it. Uh, and then I calculate statistics that we would put into a table in the paper. And then I plotted the data using ggplot2 and 4cats to get everything to line up like this. And then use something that's not in the R for data science book, something called ggridges, which is an extra geom for gg2plot that generates these stacked density plots. And then I arranged the plots for the figure using Calplot, which is a, a, an additional package that you can download. And the links for those are found here uh, at the bottom. And so this was an exciting figure for me. Sure, it took about a month to make it and to learn everything that I need to do and, and pull it together. But overall, uh, it was a good experience for me. And I learned a lot doing this, uh, making this figure not only in terms of wrangling the data with R and importing and tidying and transforming and visualizing, but also I had a lot of time as I was struggling to think about how I wanted to communicate information 
and what information I wanted to communicate within my figure. Uh, I went through a number of drafts and the ultimate figure gives me not only positional data but also gives me a sense of how each position changes throughout the entire simulation. And ultimately I learned the usefulness of R and the R packages for making uh, the appearance of figures consistent simply because I controlled everything and was able to dictate uh, every piece of the figure and so I can make the same figure every time and just change the data set underneath it and get them all to look as the same which makes it great if you're trying to communicate and compare data uh, across several data sets. And as I was moving forward thinking well R is a great tool what else can I do with it I learned a bit more about something called R Markdown. Uh, this is an R Markdown's highlighted at the very end of the R for Data Science book and the short summary or the way I think about it is it's a document or a notebook where I can include my R code and analysis and my plots and I can also write about them and do word processing that I would normally do in Word I can include that in Markdown and so it really combines two things that I used to do separately into the same program and makes it easier and allows me to streamline my work more. And so the basic R Markdown document includes a number of pieces and we'll dig into an actual document a little bit later. The first part is a header which you put your title and your author and your date and a few other things. You can also configure whether you want it to be HTML or PDF outputs. You then can have code chunks shown here in grays where you can you can load your packages and, and set options and down below here I'm doing some analysis uh, you can have inline R code here if I want the document to change every time I update it with a, a system date it'll tell it there and I can have basic word processing functions where I put some sort of title in and it will adopt a header format so the output from this would be this table here and so this R code chunk that I had written in Markdown then produces this table. Uh, and it's really nice because I can keep track of what I'm doing with the comments, and my analysis, and not have that show up in the final version. Uh, but I also can track down and remember what I did to generate each plot as I do it. In addition to the HTML style output, you can also get a PDF output. And I'm showing that example here. This is a, a lab protocol that I wrote for my students. I get really nice looking paragraphs and text. I can make chemical formulas look really nice. I can make tables where students can then fill in data once they get the paper copy and then create example plots that they would then have to do later on to try to, to analyze their data. Uh, and so I really enjoyed working with R Markdown because of the flexibility in its output, uh, but also the things that would, in Word, take me a little bit longer, I now can do in a shorter amount of time. So how has it helped? It's combined the word processing and data visualization, visual, visualization aspects of what I do in one software, whereas previous my workflow would have been Word plus Excel plus Inkscape to produce graphics. And more recently, something I've been working on with my students is it's created consistency in data reports because I'm able to create templates that I can use to help students learn how to process their data. So that's what we're going to go to now is to look at one of these templates and uh, I'll dig in a little more into the details of the R Markdown document. So this template is found in the GitHub site. You're welcome again to, to take a look at it and to dig into it along with me as I go through it. So here's the header. And in this case, what this report is for is for comparing some data sets that we have that um, we're going to be comparing mutants between a control and a series of changes to, to the protein such that we create a mutant. And so I want to be able to, to indicate what mutant I'm looking at. I can have the student as they do the report put their name in and the date that they did it. And in the end we're going to produce an HTML document that has a table of contents and, and we'll put in the table of contents everything that's out to header 3 and then also this table of contents will float. And I'll show you what these mean in the final product because in the early product where you just have the markdown template, it doesn't mean much. So this is one of the code chunks 
that uh, I use to load the packages that are required for the template. And if I want to load these packages and not run the entire document, I can come over here to the right side and just say run current chunk and it will load these packages. The way to set up one of these code chunks is you can include this chunk here which you have your, your, your quote and then you say R and set up and then a, a series of options like include false. This will not show up in the final report though it's going to be used for it. And then you close out this card code chunk using uh, three more quotes. If I wanted to put a new one of these in, there's a shortcut, Control alt i it automatically sets up this code chunk for you, and that way you can go in and just fill in your R code, and if you want to set any of the options, you can. Um, this is really one of the most important chunks of code in my document because this is where the students are going to put in what their data, uh, where their data files are. And so I have all of them download the template into a file folder, and then they load in the data files that they need um, using this chunk. So in the first two sections, we set the common name. So here I'm going to assign to mute the common name of the file, because all the analysis files have a common name. So in this case, it's going to be tetherin mutant117 to Alla. And now this uh, piece will be appended onto these uh, four file types that we're going to use in our analysis using uh, the read functions and paste to put mute, so this chunk of code, and then the type of file that's needed in each case. I also have students give a display name for the mutant, and that way when we're looking through the figures this mutation shows up that way. When I'm looking at a number of these documents side by side by side, I know what mutation I'm looking at each time. If I want to run this code, I would come over and click play to run the current chunk, and the data gets loaded in. Now in the final report, I don't want to see this, so I set echo to false, and I also turn off warnings and messages. That way, um, in the final report, none of this shows up. The data are just loaded silently uh, behind it. So this is an example of how one of the encode or in uh, code chunks work within the markdown document. You also can do R code in line, and that's what I've got set up here. So in the next section, I'm going to start doing some plotting and generating tables to actually see the data. So I have my header, and then I say equilibration of, and then I've got the quote with R, and then mute name. If you remember from the beginning, I set mute name to be glue 117 ala. So what this is going to do is every time it, this chunk shows up, it's going to insert that name so that I know what I'm doing. And this way the students have to, don't have to go line by line by line and put in a new mutation name every time. It propagates down throughout the document. Um, so in this card chunk, I'm going to generate the R, uh, what's called an RMSD plot. I don't want to show it. I don't care about the warnings or the messages showing up. And I want it to be center aligned in the final document. I then have all of my code that I want to do, and then if I push play, it'll run, and I get my plot down here. And so the plots show up here rather than in the viewer window, uh, but you can change that uh, using the the, uh, the settings for your R Markdown document. Um, and you'll notice, in addition, it's propagated that mutant name that I wanted earlier down into this plot. Because I'm working with students and I want them to understand, I also put in comments like, like we would normally do in R code, and this really helps them. Even though they're not having to actually do any of the coding, they can actually go down and follow what's going on at each stage of the game and, and understand where this is coming from. If I want to make a, a... You can do various types of plots. Here I've got one that's going to facet and show a series of data. Uh, sets from that we've extracted out. Um, you can do tables, and there are two packages that I've used to make tables. One that I did use was cable, along with the cable extra package. I'm not using that now, 
uh, going instead to use the data table function because it turned out to be a little more useful for this particular template. And so if I run this, I get this table that shows up down below. And in the final document, if there are multiple pages, this would be interactive as well. You could sort it using standard deviation and IQR or the max and the min. Uh, and so this is really nice from the perspective in that not only do I get a report, I've got a report I can interact with and sort my data. And I'll show you in the final report that this all this carries through. Uh, <coughs> in addition to the code chunks, which are really important, I also have put in here areas where I want data to be explained. So here we explain how we generated the data. And then here's an area that the students will have to personalize each time, which is their interpretation. And this is really one of the advantages of the template for me. Rather than having students get buried in, having to generate the figure and make it look like what I do, we've already gone through and with the students I made this template so they understand what each section does and now they can focus on putting data in and interpreting the data correctly. And I think that's the greater advantage of these templates for me is that students are really focused on interpreting data and making and, and making these these reports focus on what was going on in the data rather than having to make 30 different figures and try to, to do all of that on top of doing data explanations and interpretations. Um, if you want to have a code chunk uh, that depends on another, you can do that as well. So this file appears earlier and I require it because I use it to get the names for producing a table later, later on. So because it requires an earlier file, I need to run everything before it. Well, there's a button that can run everything that came before and make sure all of that works. And then if I want to make this plot, it appears as well. Um, so these templates are really fantastic. Uh, for my students and I've had a lot of fun generating them and to generate a final report if I have everything I want which I do in this case I can do what's called knit and there are a number of options you can do knit to HTML, knit to PDF, or knit to Word. If you knit to PDF you need a LaTeX uh, copy which you can download and TinyTeX is what I use, TinyTeX is what I use but there are other options out there and Word requires Microsoft Word to, to load in there. I'm going to knit to HTML because ultimately this is going to be posted online. So when I do that, it brings up the R Markdown console and it sits there and compiles. Now this is a uh, fairly lengthy document, so it takes a couple of seconds to compile everything. But in the end, it'll produce a nice HTML file for me. And it's going to do it over here in the, in the viewer pane, but I'm going to pull it up in the browser to let everyone see it. So I talked about the table of contents the table of contents and I can use this to navigate. Um, I would normally have, would have filled this in and here are the figures as they go down and then here are the data and explanation interpretations. So those uh, the, the tags that we put here, the hashtag or the pound sign depending on your generation, the number of, of these that you have in front indicates what level of header you're at. So if I go back to my HTML. This is going to be uh, one level of header, whereas this is a separate level of header. And these are the different, and these are where, when I asked about the table of contents, what header level it shows, it'll only show down to the third level. So data explanation interpretation doesn't show up, but other headers will in each, within each section. In addition to the standard plots, we also are doing some analysis in that we ran a model to get the R value of comparing the wild type and the mutants, so we're looking at controls. We used the ggrepel function within geom, uh, within ggplot to indicate what our outliers are so students can, can, can identify this quickly. We made a graphic within ggplot, similar to the draw protein uh, package that Paul Brent Brennan has put out there, where it takes the outliers up here and annotates them on the structure. So not only do you have the data vis visualization, for a biochemist, we would typically look at something like this to understand where within the protein the outliers are occurring. 
and we do this a couple different ways with a couple different data sets. Again, this is fantastic for my students because they put the data in up top and it generates all of these plots down below. And so they really can produce a nice and consistent plot overall. So how has this helped for my students in the lab and, and working with small groups of students? I can produce consistency in data reports. Now, my students are very tentative about using R and RStudio, but something like this, this template has helped them learn because they can work with me to generate the first time and then they can learn how it works by using it and writing their own reports and then they can start derivatizing it on their own once they get more comfortable with it. Now, one of the reasons I'm still working on this project, even though I, in terms of creating consistent reports, is because I do a larger scale project in my biochemistry lecture, and this is called a course-based undergraduate research experience, or a CURE. My lecture course consists of 50 to 100 students in a single class, and I'm the only instructor. And one thing I'd like to do is give them some research experience, because more than two-thirds of the class has not done any sort of research experience prior to entering my class, and I teach mostly, mostly juniors and seniors. And so I have them do a research project where we analyze the effects of a DNA mutation on protein structure and function. And we use open access mutation and protein structure databases. They do some modeling. They use some of the web-based servers out there. And it ultimately, they produce insights into how these mutations affect protein structure and sometimes lead to human disease. Now we're doing this on data that has not previously been analyzed before. So all of the results are completely novel, and that's where the research experience comes in. There's no set answer. There's just a path you would follow to develop this idea, and eventually they are starting to synthesize new ideas based on their own data. And our current workflow is to use the Ensemble and Protein Data Bank repositories to get our mutation data and our structural data. The students then spend about six to eight weeks doing data collection and analysis. And this is where I had been previously for about, my gosh, two years, three years now I've been doing this project. More recently, I've been working to incorporate open science framework into this. And this open science framework is sort of like GitHub for biological and, and chemical data. I can put all of the data there, make it publicly available, including the analysis, and then others can build upon our data using the fork system, much like in GitHub. And this is where those data reports being consistent would be really nice. I'd like for, for uh, the public or outsiders who are looking at our data in the open science framework to have a consistent experience and be able to compare the student data uh, on their own, but also have the students begin to develop a data portfolio if they're applying for a job or, or for graduate school. I'd like them to have a data report that looks nice. The trick is students don't like to use R and so I've been working to try to find solutions to do this sort of templating like I've done with with my research students but be able to scale it up to 100 to maybe even more maybe 150 students per semester in a single class and that's where I'm struggling but I've got some ideas I'm going to lead you down the path of what I'm thinking of doing and maybe this will spur some ideas of your own so I'm trying to make student reporting consistent. And the challenges I have are that students are dealing with diverse approaches to the problem and data types. They have diverse backgrounds and skill levels. And I want to provide guided instruction without sort of forcing the students to follow this exact path. My goal is really to challenge the students, but I never ever want to frustrate them to the point that they quit or give up or, or think that research and that analysis is something that is just too hard. So I want to create an uphill path for them, but I never want it to be a barrier to their learning. And this is really where I'm struggling with, with working with the students, but I've got some ideas. Um, overall, I have limited instructor and student resources. I don't want to do something that's going to cost $400 and be prohibitive to students who may be in financial, uh, may have financial issues. And also, my students use basically every operating system. In a class of 100, I've got students using Windows, I've got students who are using Macs, Chromebook-only students, iPad-only students, and even students who don't have their own computers. So I need a system that doesn't require the student to have a specific operating system 
or a computer at all. I need something that can work on a mobile device maybe, or maybe from a computer lab. And so one thing I'm working towards is using a combination of our markdown with Shiny to make apps for students to teach them how to do data interpretation and communication. So let me show you how I've gotten to this idea. It actually started when something failed in the classroom. I'm in the middle of my class, I've got 55 students in the classroom and we're ready to use a simulator that was based in Excel to look at circular dichroism. And circular dichroism tells me about the squiggles and lines and things in a protein structure. It, it tells me about secondary structure. And it's an important tool that's used throughout biochemistry and the students need to know how to, how to use it. Well, I'm in class, this fails on me because some of the newer versions of Excel don't, don't work with the, the spreadsheet that have been used originally. So I did what every good teacher did in the middle of class when something fails, improvised, and I got, got some group work going and, and we were able to piece it together, but I wasn't satisfied with having to do that in the future. So my first step was well, I went back to R Markdown and took the simulator and unpacked it so that I could convey the idea that the simulator would have conveyed. And I generated some plots that the simulator would have done for me. I generated some pictures for the students so they could look at the data and understand how circular dichroism works. But what I missed about doing this was that the students couldn't interact with the data and, and get a sense of how the data are built on forward. So I did a little bit of research and found out that you can incorporate interactive elements into our markdown using something called Shiny. And if you want to see this markdown document, it is in the GitHub repository, a CD explain version 2.rmd. Shiny allows you to make interactive R code, and it is mentioned briefly in the R for Data Science book, if you want to read about it. Um, and you basically write your R code like you normally would in a Markdown document, and then you make one section or chunk Shiny enabled. And, and to do Shiny, you have your standard R function, and this is what was going to run in the background for my spreadsheet that was no longer working. And so what I did was create a user interface for this R function so that students didn't have to dig through this. They could just use a user interface. And let me show you what this looks like. So here's my R Markdown document. I've got it written much like I showed you before with some basic text. I've got code chunks. I've got my R function where I generate some plots. And ultimately down here at the bottom, I've got my Shiny app. And it doesn't look any different than any other code chunk, except that it has these shiny, shiny applications in them. So here's my user interface, and then here's the back side of it, which is all the R code. Now if I run this document, it's going to appear in the viewer pane, and then I'm going to pop it out into Chrome. It renders just like Markdown. <coughs> Though sometimes it takes a little longer. And so here's my my R Markdown text, and then here's my Shiny app. So if I want to change the plot, I can just use these click boxes. Or if I want to change the elements of the secondary structure that I'm displaying, I can change it to 25, and if it doesn't add it to 100%, it gives me a warning, which is nice to tell the students what's going wrong. And now I've changed the plot, and I can do this in, in various ways. I also can go from prediction mode, which was what the, the simulator was good at, and just give the students a sense of what different types of proteins look like in when uh, that are undergoing CD spectroscopy. And so I can say, oh, this protein looks like this. Hemoglobin, the blood, the, the oxygen transporting protein looks like this. Antibodies would have a CD spectrum that look like this. And so I got that level of interactivity with it, um, but these mixes of, of Shiny and, and Markdown, uh, oops, where am I going here? Only can run on the web or they can run locally. So I had an issue of being able to distribute this to my students easily. So this is where, rather than using Markdown with Shiny, what if I use Shiny with Markdown? 
and so I made a shiny app which you can go to this website and view it if you want I'm just going to run it locally in our studio that does the same type of thing and this app also is available in the github repository if you'd like to take a look at it and figure out what's going on so I load my packages I've got my user interface like I had before and then I've got some stylistic things that I wanted to add in there and then here's all of my R code it's written just like you would an R script in our studio. And then if I want to run it locally, I come up here and press run app and it comes up in a new window. So this looks a lot like the plot that I showed you earlier, but the user interface is a little different. I've got what section I want to use. Do I show the secondary structure guides? And this time, rather than having it pop an error every time this doesn't add to 100%, I have a submit button. So you can go in and not be harassed by the program if you're changing something. Get everything changed and submit, and it renders the new plot. If I want to go in display mode, I can do that, and I can see different proteins. And at the same time, I also can provide information that is dynamic. And I can tell, well, this contains 74% helix, 0% beta, and 17% random coil. If I go to a different protein, these numbers change as well. And so this added the interactive elements that I wanted to it. Uh, and I can run this in the web browser in that I can put it on the internet. It renders very well on mobile and iPads and, and is great for those students who may not have a Mac or a Windows uh, computer that they want to use. Additionally, all of that markdown or our markdown document that I wrote, I can include those in a different tab. So I've got my data tab here the student gets confused and wants more information. Here's that earlier R Markdown document that I wrote on CD Spectra. All I had to do was tell Shiny, well, make a new tab, incorporate this file, and it provides information that it looks just like that nice R Markdown file that I generated earlier. And so this is where I'm going with my ideas for how to create a experience for students to learn how to make data figures and and do it interactively but also sort of control and guide their experience at the same time and so while well, I've been able to use R markdown successfully to make student data reports consistent for a large class size that's where I struggled and this is where I'm working on the shiny app and you having students make a, a figures using a shiny app so I can take the functions that I have existing out of my data report template make it into an R pack package, or just an, a function in general, uh, and then make a shiny app for guiding students for how to do this. And that will help me refine this in-class project and hopefully challenge them and provide a good experience with research but not frustrate them to the point of giving up. And hopefully, whether they go into data science or to biochemical research or medicine or physician's assistants or nurses or whatever they decide to do, I can promote data literacy and visualization literacy so they can understand data more effectively. In addition, I've had some fun making these, these simulators using R Markdown and, and Shiny, and so there's a lot of biochemical techniques that I could probably make these simulators for in the future as well that would help my students understand data in, in more detail. And so this is where I'm heading as, as well once I get this data report solution uh, worked out. So this ends the talk. I'd like to thank my amazing students. They are not only good mentees, but also they are often collaborators and provide ideas for how I can improve my teaching and my research. My colleagues in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at JMU, uh, Paul Brennan, who was very much the inspiration for me moving over to R to use it in my work, and Jesse in the R for Data Science community for allowing me to talk about a little bit of what I do and what I use R for.